Hello everyone, it's good to be back here with all of you and welcome to our IVF webinar live event and uh, welcome uh, Professor Sachs Minhas is with us once more. Thank you so much for joining us again and bringing another topic on male fertility and um, how are you feeling tonight? Professor Minhas, can you hear me? Very good, very good. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I can hear you. Can okay, you hear me that's okay? that's really good. And uh, please yeah, let, let us know that you can yeah. hear us loud and clear. We just want to make sure that all is okay. Uh, and of course, we will start our webinar with uh, Professor Minha's uh, presentation. This time, he will discuss sperm collection. And uh, after that, as always, you will have a chance to ask your questions. So remember to just type those in the chat section and uh, Professor Minhas will help you out with them, no doubt here. So don't hesitate. Anything that you have in mind, go ahead and type those in, of course. And uh, as you know, there are over 300 IVF webinars on my IVF answers already. Uh, so I just also want to mention that we are here every single day. As you know, this week and previous week, we were focusing and we are still focusing on fertility, male fertility. And we want to provide you with as many topics and as many um, interesting uh, stuff as we can, of course. And uh, well, I guess we can start with the presentation. Professor Mehas, ready to start? Yeah, fantastic. All right, perfect. Let's go ahead then. Okay, thanks. For, thanks very much indeed, uh, Caroline, and uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm actually surprised we have so many people interested in how to sperm collect, but um, I think it's an interesting area, and uh, I'm a urologist who deals with male infertility, so it's kind of a very a subject that I'm very close to, uh, it's close to my heart. But I thought we'd make this slightly different, talk a little bit about male fertility, why we sometimes have to collect sperm, particularly from kind of surgery and the kind of techniques that we use. So how do we define infertility? Because I think male infertility is very important. We must remember that 50% of fertility problems are due to the male. So it's, a it's defined as the failure to conceive after um, one year of unprotected intercourse. Um, and it's quite common. It affects 15% of couples. So that means one in seven are affected by infertility. And almost 50% are actually due to the male. Now, it's interesting, azoospermia or no sperm in the ejaculate um, is found about in 20% of infertile men. And in fact, a sperm density or count less than a million, remember a normal count uh, is 15 million, is found in, less than, is, is found in about 10% of men. So it's a significant problem. What we do know is fertility rates have very much declined in men over time. Since over the last 50 years, we think due to industrialization, sperm counts have gone down significantly. And we don't fully know why, but you'll see some data in the news presented about so-called um, endocrine disrupting chemicals um, which might be an issue or problem these kind of cause estrogenization of uh, the male if you look at sperm counts you hear that overall um, you can see I'm just gonna turn my video off because I think there's an internet connection problem um, but hopefully that will improve things but Basically, what you see is that normal sperm count is here. And what you see is the normal sperm count shows that your total sperm concentration is 15 million and above, motility of 40%, and morphology of 4%. And these aren't strict figures. These aren't saying that people who have um, sperm count outside this is abnormal. Okay, so overall... So, what... Minhas, I am sorry for interrupting. Actually, you know, the sound was really okay. So it's up to you, but if you wish, you can switch this on. I will okay, let you know I'll... if something is wrong. Let me know okay? if it, you... No problem, of course. Again, there we go. So basically, the issue is that none of these are kind of strict rules, okay? So these, these studies are based on about 1,200 patients. So, of course, there's going to be a lot of variation in sperm counts. Now, if you look at the causes of male infertility... The problem group is this group here of 30% or a third unexplained. And often patients say to me, you know, what is the cause of my infertility? And about a third, I can't say what the cause is. But there are other causes. There can be hormonal problems. There can be varicocils, sexual factors, erection problems. And there can be obviously infections and also a history of undescended testes. 
And I think it's worthwhile just giving you a brief overview of some of these problems. So if you look at the kind of anatomy, what was the sperm production? The sperm is obviously produced in the testicles, and the testicles then uh, produce the sperm, it's then stored in the epididymis, and in the epididymis it undergoes some changes which make it more um, or have a better ability to kind of penetrate the egg. From there, it's then transported by the vas deferens, and the vas deferens is a structure that conveys sperm directly into the body towards the seminal vesicles. And the seminal vesicles are structures effectively which um, essentially um, control in terms of the volume of the ejaculate and reduce most of the volume of the ejaculate. And what you can see here is the seminal vesicles here. This is the prostate which also provides. So this is the vas deferens going in, testicle, and then you ejaculate it through here. So if we kind of look at the the, the structure as well, this is a bit more intense structure, the testicle, this is the epididymis where sperm undergoes maturation, and this is a varicocele, the varicocele is the varicose veins of the testicle. Now normally a lot of men will have a varicocele, but what happens is that um, the, these veins dilate, but they're quite common even in men who've got normal sperm counts, and the question of course is, you know, when are they significant, when do they cause a problem? These varicose veins are dilated, can cause heat damage, and can lower sperm counts. And they can also damage something called sperm DNA as well, which might be a factor, as we've now found, in terms of pregnancy and improving pregnancy rates. Again, this is going into the structure, testicle, and the testicle consists of lots of tubes inside called seminiferous tube, and that's where the sperm is produced. Sometimes we have to directly go into some of these structures to extract sperm for various reasons, particularly men who don't produce sperm in ejaculate. I'm just going to skip that slide because I've already done that. This again is a bit more of a slide showing these seminiferous tubules. Sperm is produced here in waves, takes about 74 days, comes out, and then goes into the vas deferens and is ejaculated, as I've already alluded to. Well, how do you collect sperm? Well, one of the options is collecting sperm is doing a standard semen analysis. And the absence period should be between two and five days. Um, if you leave it too long or too short, it can affect the sperm count. There should be a quality control on how it's assessed. But the main issue is about collection. And you shouldn't use spermicidals. Um, you can use certain contraceptive, uh, you know, condoms to actually collect it. But you need to transport it to a lab within an hour. Some patients find it difficult to ejaculate, for example, in a lab. That can be very difficult, strange circumstances. And therefore, you might want to produce the sample at home and transport it in. And that's the kind of standard semen analysis that I already showed you that slide for and um, in terms of the type of um, concentration, motility that you see. And again, this highlights that there. This is the kind of the normal values that you assess. And these kind of values can be affected in terms of the way the sample is collected. Um, what about patients who have azeospermia? That's, I think, really interesting. Why do we collect sperm in these kind of patients? Well, you do have patients who have no sperm in ejaculate, and that's called azeospermia. And that can either be due to a blockage or a a non-obstructive cause, in other words, not a blockage. And in other words, the engine room isn't working as well, so those seminiferous tubules aren't functioning as well as they should. Blockages can be due to various reasons, but characteristically, if you've got a blockage, you can feel the sperm tube called that epididymis full. The testis size is normal. And normally hormones from the brain called FSH and LH are normally this normal value because the brain isn't having to push the testicles to work harder. Most blockages you get are from the epididymis. So it can be due to infections, can be due to trauma in some cases, previous surgery. But important causes also include absence of the sperm tube or vas deferens, which can also occur. And you can also get low ejaculation volumes or due to blockages near the prostate or the seminal vesicles, because that's where most of the sperm is produced. You also need to make sure that men produce low volume might have or no sperm because they don't they can orgasm and don't produce any sperm um, because the, the ejaculate doesn't come forwards they can have something called retrograde ejaculation retrograde ejaculation is very common in diabetics where the muscle that contracts normally to endure an ejaculation is relaxed due to damage to nerves which then cause the fluid to go back in the bladder so it's very important to assess these kind of things in patients um, in terms of fertility potential so vasal aplasia is very important because that's something where you get absence of the sperm tubes associated with cystic fibrosis gene carrier status. It doesn't mean to say patients have cystic fibrosis, 
means that they've got a mutation in the gene that could cause that. And that's often important to exclude as a, a cause of blockages or obstructive azospermia. But these are the various causes I've outlined. And so they can occur near the prostate, the epididymis. They can occur in the testicle as well. And sometimes we have to go and retrieve sperm in certain cases. We're just going to move slides. What about blockages? What can you do about them? How can, can you can you change the plumbing? Can you actually um, reconstruct? You can. And certainly one of the most commonest causes for reconstruction that we do in those sperm is uh, vasovasostomy, or what we term as vasectomy reversal. Some men might have had a vasectomy before, didn't think they were going to have any more kids, meet a new partner, and want to have a reversal of vasectomy before. Some people have infections. And sometimes we have to join the vas deferens or tube to the epididymis, called a vasoepididostomy. And very occasionally, patients have blockages near the prostate as well, which you can surgically um, deobstruct as well. Vasoepididostomy, as I said, is joining up the vas deferens to sperm tubes. About 30% pregnancy rates can be achieved. And I'll just show you some pictures, what you can do. You join the vas deferens to the epididymis here, which is this tubule, which you can join it to. And that's the kind of finished product. Normally the blockage is down here, so sperm normally comes out here, but can't get through. So then you disconnect this tube and join up the piece to the epididymis here. And that's one cause of obstruction. At the same time, you can take sperm and retrieve sperm and extract sperm in those cases. And this is just this is done microscopically under a microscope and takes about three or four hours to do, but it's one option in terms of uh, trying to reverse uh, infertility in men who don't produce sperm. And these are some of the results. And when you reconstruct, it takes about a year before you get sperm fully appearing in the ejaculate in this case. However, perhaps um, less commonly and very rarely, you can actually get cysts of the prostate, which can cause blockages. So this is the ejaculation duct that comes through here. And what you can do is you can get blockages occurring, and therefore men have a low volume ejaculate and no sperm. And you can incise or actually de-roof some of these cysts, which can cause blockages. Vasectomy reversal, and some men want to have a vasectomy reversal, as I already alluded to. And this is probably the most common cause of obstructive azospermia or no sperm that we deal with. And in these cases, you can see here, this is one of my patients. This is the cut ends of the sperm tube that's previously been um, blocked by vasectomy. And what, I, what I'm doing under here is joining up the tubes under a very fine microscope and looking and this is the two ends of the tube you can see the lumen and it takes about three hours to perform and this is joining them up at the same time as this we take sperm from the testicle to freeze because we don't know if this join up is going to work so we want to back up for patients in this scenario in order to extract sperm so if you look at it what are the two factors for vasectomy reversal in terms of whether it works well number one is the time elapsed since the vasectomy, the longer it is, certainly over 15 years, the results fall quite dramatically. So if somebody's had a vasectomy within five years, then you've got a high probability it'll be successful. But we've also got to weigh up the female partner's ovarian reserve. How good is her fertility? So that's the other issue as well. So other reasons why we extract sperm or retrieve or collect sperm, not only blockages, but we'll talk about men who can't ejaculate for various reasons. Sometimes it's psychological. We try many mechanisms to try and improve that, giving them drugs to try and stimulate ejaculation. But this can be a psychological issue. And sometimes we actually have to go directly into the engine room or testicle to extract sperm. And that's called ejaculatory failure. Sometimes they have retrograde. Remember I talked about the ejaculate going back into the bladder, such as men with diabetes with low volume. Sometimes we, there's nothing we can do about that. We have to go and collect sperm from the testicle. But obstruction and failure of the testicle to work, in other words, non-obstructive azospermia, are the two most common causes. So sometimes we do sperm extraction. That's quite common in IVF units. And what we do is we extract sperm directly from the testicle or sperm tube at the back of the epididymis. Okay, and that's called a PISA or a percutaneous epididymal sperm aspiration, where we put a needle into the epididymis. We do this if patients have got a blockage, and we can aspirate and extract sperm, which can then use, be used for ICSI treatment or IVF treatment, and very successfully. Sometimes we do something called MISA. So PISA is a needle. MISA is where you actually make a direct incision on that epididymis, where stores sperm, when men are 
or obstructing, and then you can literally take the sperm from that and give it to a scientist who can then freeze the sperm or use it for ICSI treatment. This is actually a testicle here. This is a mesa being done. This is the epididymis, and what we're doing is making a cut here and actually extracting sperm from there. But perhaps the more common reason why we perform sperm extraction or collection is for men who have non-obstructive angiospermia. In other words, they have usually slightly smaller testes, the hormone profile is raised, and furthermore, what you find in these patients is the testis size um, doesn't reflect obstruction. In a sperm tube, you can't simply put it into the epididymis or sperm tube. You've got to actually go directly into the engine room or testis and biopsy and take song. And there are different ways you can do it, and controversy about which method is best. I use something called a microtesi, first described by my colleague Peter Schlegel in New York. And what we've got to be really wary about is non-obstructive angiospermia. There are many causes. Some patients may have had chemotherapy as a child, undescended testis, may have had mumps, history of testis cancer, lots of reasons why they have non-obstructive angiospermia. But whenever we kind of treat patients, is we've also got to be truly aware of the female partner's age and fertility decline, and therefore we've got to weigh up treatments in that context. So when we kind of optimize people for non-obstructive angiospermia and sperm collection or extraction, we take a history, we examine them, we investigate them with genetic tests, hormone checks, scans of the testicle as well. We make sure that we know the partner's age, the female partner's age as well, and how quickly we've got to move. And we then talk about type of sperm retrieval. There is also some controversy whether before kind of operation such as TZ, you should have hormone manipulation, in other words, give hormone treatments to raise testosterone to improve your chances. Again, the evidence for that is really quite limited. And also varicocils, remember we talked about them at the beginning, and varicocils sometimes cause fertility problems by heat damage, but there's an argument that fixing them before testicular sperm extraction in men who don't have sperm might improve the outcomes. But again, this is quite a controversial area in uh, urology. Genetically, we, in these men, we make sure that they have genetic uh, tests done, which are blood tests, look for chromosome problems. And it's in men who have asiospermia or no sperm, there's about a 15% chance they might have a karyotype or chromosome problem. We also look at something called Y deletion. And Y deletions are wipeouts on the Y male chromosome, which could or do code for sperm production. If you get a wipeout in certain regions, in the three commonest regions are A, B, and C, if you have a wipeout in A and a B region, then you won't find sperm when you do these exploratory procedures to extract or collect sperm. With C deletions, you can, but you will transmit that deletion to a male child by ICSI if you do, because it's carried on the Y chromosome. So it's important to do genetic testing in patients as well. And this just highlights this slide that if you have these deletions of an A and a B, you won't find sperm. With C deletions, you can. So what are the techniques? I'm sorry about the graphic pictures, but I think it's probably uh, one way of illustrating this. And what you can see here is that in theory, and we don't know why, in about 50% of men who have non-obstructive asiospermia, you can find sperm in the testicle. Now, why that doesn't come out, we don't know. But what we do know is by doing an operation to go directly into the engine room, then you can find sperm. Now, the middle picture, I don't know if you can see that very well, is something called a teaser. This is somebody having a needle put in with a, into the testicle and to try and get bits of the testicle, which they can then try and extract sperm from. It's not a great technique in non-obstructive asiospermia. And in fact, this is one of my patients who actually has an obstruction, uh, which is easier to do because you, invariably you'll find sperm. But if you have a... a, a a problem in terms of non-obstructive asiospermia, the sperm retrieval rates are fairly low from it's probably about 17-18%. On the other hand, if you take multiple biopsies, which is taken areas randomly in the testicle, that's the other method. This is a tissue of the testicle that you can extract sperm from. The alternative is the microtesia, and this is this under the microscope, which I'll show you a few pictures of in a second. And the principle being that if you open a testicle up like a book, the areas of those seminiferous tubules we talked about earlier that contain sperm appear more dilated under the microscope, and it's more precise and associated with less risk. That's a procedure that most of us around the world would be doing, and most of us who have published our results in the literature. These are kind of some of the results. If you look at them, the terminology of conventional testicular sperm extraction or collection um, 
appears to be slightly inferior to the MTZ. Um, again, there's no, been no trials that compare the two, but generally speaking, most surgeons around the world would prefer to do an MTZ or micro-TZ, um, which I think is entirely reasonable. And overall, this was studied by my friend and colleague, Peter Schlegel, who showed that the best technique appeared to be um, a micro-TZ over the other techniques in terms of sperm extraction or collection. This is it being performed in just diagrammatic form, Open the testicle like a book. The areas that contain sperm look more dilated and opaque. And these are the areas you then give to an embryologist to extract sperm. And it's not under general anesthetic. It's about a two, three hour procedure. And obviously it's quite involved. And obviously patients need to be counseled appropriately about this. This is in real life. This is one of my patients. I've opened the testicle like a book here. And then the areas that contain sperm, as you can see, look more dilated, more kind of juicy. I suppose, and these are the bits that would more likely to contain sperm. Um, a lot of patients ask me, well, looking at my history, I haven't got any sperm, you've diagnosed non-obstruction on the basis of tests and genetics, what are my chances, are there anything else that I can do that might predict whether we find sperm? And the answer is no. There doesn't seem to be any predictive factors in terms of whether you will find sperm in patients. It's irrespective of the size of the testicle, the FSH levels, which you would have thought would be counterintuitive because you would have thought the smaller the testis, the worse the chances are, the higher the FSH, which is the hormone that drives sperm production in the brain, then the less likely. But there's no evidence for that in, in studies that many of us have done, including myself. There's an argument about doing hormone manipulation. In other words, giving drugs before sperm extraction. Is there evidence for that? It's very mixed. I don't tend to do it unless a patient has a very low testosterone, uh, but some of my colleagues do. And these operations are not with problems, okay? So one of the things we warn patients about is that their hormone levels might fall after um, surgery, but usually goes back to normal after about um, six months. So we often check the hormone levels after such surgery because effectively you're removing hormone bearing tissue as well when you're taking these seminiferous tubules to look for sperm. Even in men with Klinefelters, which is a common genetic problem, we can still find sperm surprisingly in these men as well. And sperm retrieval rates um, in the US are about 50%, around Europe are slightly different, lower. We don't quite know why. So it's very important when we try and collect sperm in patients, we do genetic testing, hormone checking, we do scans, we potentially might want to fix a varicocele, we might want to give drugs before they have these treatments, should you freeze sperm, and that's a really controversial area. There's no evidence that using frozen sperm is any worse than fresh sperm in live birth rates. But what there is evidence for is that in about 5% of patients, if you thaw sperm, it may not survive the um, the freezing process. And also surgical technique is important. Do a micro as I said, a lot of my colleagues do, but there are also some people who do the other techniques, and we believe that that's, the sperm retrieval rates are higher and, and seem to be more or better with MTZ as well. So I'm going to finish there. You may have some questions to ask, um, and if there are any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed for yet another amazing presentation with lots of details again. But of course, that's what we are here for. So huge thanks for that. And we are waiting for some questions, actually, because someone is typing. And while we are waiting for the question, actually, uh, let me ask you one of the questions that uh, I've heard a lot quite recently, because of course, what's going on with pandemic, etc. You have said that frozen sperm doesn't... Uh, it, it's not different than the fresh, but have you seen that um, you are now work, working more on frozen sperm because of what's going on? Uh, no, I think one of the things, it's interesting what you raised, Caroline, about, uh, I think, really talking about COVID. Um, yes. And I think from the point of view of COVID, uh, you know, we know that potentially um, it could affect um, your, you know, your, your, your testes. And I've certainly had some patients who have had COVID and then developed testicular problems. Now, we don't know the full association, but if you look at studies that have been done in hospitalized patients, there is quite a lot of testicular damage. And therefore, undoubtedly, we think it does probably affect it. The studies that were done recently showed about 
at 90% of patients, in fact, had very low sperm counts or no sperm um, after they'd had COVID. But again, this wasn't very well controlled, the studies. There are many other factors. The patients being in hospital also had various drugs, and therefore we don't know whether it was the, the other effects or whether it was the COVID itself that was causing uh, the fertility problem. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much for answering my very first question. But of course, as you can see, uh, our patients are typing the questions in right now as we speak. So let me go to the question from Karen that we've got. Okay, the first one. So if sperm sample is within normal range, would testing of FSH, LH be recommended or any other testing? No. So I, I think if you're... if you know, if the sperm sample semen analysis is normal and you're dealing with infertility, that's the kind of unexplained group we're talking about. So we wouldn't necessarily do FSH and LH testing in that group um, unless we thought it was a hormone problem. But that's usually if the sperm count is abnormal or there's no sperm. You've raised an interesting point about, sp I mean, is what we didn't talk about, and I know this is not the forum for this, but I think it's a useful message to get across that we've got to remember that a third of patients are unknown fertility. You can have a normal semen analysis and still not be able to conceive. And the question, of course, is why is that? And I think more and more what we've realized, and I think the next question highlights that actually, um, uh, is that it's DNA damage. And we think that in about a third of these patients, they may have DNA damage. So it's not just about what the sperm looks like on a semen analysis. It's also about the sperm integrity in terms of DNA integrity, which has become much more of a novel tool that we use now in testing because there are factors that can cause DNA damage. Um, and perhaps I can answer that in the next uh, question. Sorry, have I, you haven't lost me yet. I, okay, maybe, maybe. I hope it's okay. Now should be okay. Thank you so much. And let's have a look at the next question and uh, two parts. How does sperm fragment or or why? Yeah. Okay, so it's, that's the question that really I'm alluding to. Is, and it's a very, very good question. So sperm DNA fragmentation is, DNA is like a ladder, okay? And if you get a break of that ladder, okay? Now, normally, the egg, we think, can repair the DNA fra fragmentation or damage. But as men get older, the DNA net damage uh, increases. As women get older, the egg is less able to repair the DNA. That's the theory. And there is evidence within the literature. So we tend to... There are, tend to be environmental factors, infections, uh, varicoceles, uh, dietary uh, factors, the imbalance between oxidants and antioxidants. But again, the evidence for all of this is a little bit fragmented. Sorry, sorry, the pun, pardon the pun, I didn't mean to say that, but is, is a little bit kind of unclear. Okay, so one of the issues is that overall, what you've got to look at and say that there are factors that cause sperm DNA damage. There may be environmental factors. We know that it may be a factor involved in embryo formation and also miscarriage and also from implantation failure in patients about um, uh, who, who are trying to have IVF treatments. So we, and as a guidelines group, and I co-chair a group called the European Association of Urology Guidelines Committee, we have put together some kind of guidelines as to when we should measure sperm DNA and how we should go about that. What we've said in those guidelines is that patients have unexplained with normal semen analysis or those patients that might have um, failed IVF treatments, then DNA fragmentation would be worthwhile uh, testing and looking at. I hope that answers the, the, the question. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much indeed. Um, okay. Uh, so, as you can see, many uh, questions are coming in, okay? Uh, many interesting ones as well. Let me go to this one then. You have mentioned 5% of patients with trouble of having quality sperm after freezing. Can you please elaborate on that? Why this is this happening and if we can know in advance that we are in this group range? Yeah. Very good question. So, I'm talking in the context of freezing sperm for operations, okay? So, what I always say to patients when I see them, and they come to me for a sperm retrieval. I say to them that, look, we've done studies, others have done studies, show no difference of using fresh or frozen sperm, for example, taken from the testicle or epididymis. The 5% represents the fact that in all patients in those groups, what we found was that the sperm just did not survive the thawing process. Now, we think that's probably the cryopreservation process. Um, invariably, however, it's due to the fact that poor quality sperm is frozen. 
the trouble is, is that you know when you faced doing an operation for somebody who has no sperm, has non obstructive age sperm, you've got to take what you've got. So what we try and do in those circumstances is to try and circumnavigate that. Is that if we find sperm on one side in an operation, it's not very good. We stop and we hope that that would be good enough for ICSI treatment. But then we leave the other testicle as a backup for the future to perhaps use fresh on the day. Overall, 5% is very low. You could argue should every single patient have a synchronous cycle of ICSI with a sperm retrieval. That logistically is, is a bit of a nightmare, very difficult to arrange. So that's the kind of reason why. Can you mitigate that? Not really. That's the problem. Uh, and that's just the, the issue of the, the crime preservation, but also freezing poor quality sperm in the first place. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. And actually, I will go to the follow-up, okay, in regards to DNA fragmentation question, pre previous one. Wow, did I hear that correctly? The ovum can correct sperm DNA fragmentation. I'd love to know the mechanism. Well, I think that's the theory, okay? And there are some studies suggesting that, okay, that in theory, the, if the younger the patient, in theory, the, the better the ability of the egg or even to correct the DNA damage or repair it, okay? But that ability seems to be lost. That's one of the theories. That's some of the research that's kind of been done. Uh, again, nobody quite knows. So it's, you've got to, although we kind of look at DNA fragmentation as this kind of novel biomarker, we also got to remember the female partner's age, the quality of her eggs as well, because we so often ignore that and our focus tends to go, then go to the sperm and really focus a lot on the sperm, basically. So I think that We've got to be a little bit careful, but that that's a theory, and that's a kind of there is some evidence back in that. All right, thank you so much for that uh, follow up indeed as well, of course. Uh, definitely interesting. Okay, let's have a look. More of those questions are coming in. There's another one. Thank you for an amazing presentation. Do you put much credence on di diet and lifestyle modifications for improving sperm health, especially with minimizing endodisruptors and supporting with antioxidants? And have you seen a very low no sperm count improving naturally? I could listen to this all day. Thank you so much indeed. Sure, it's very complimentary and thank you. I think that, um, that again, we've got to be very careful about the, I mean, one of the aspects, just going back to health, okay, one of the things that's really emerging, and I suppose one of the things as a clinician who deals with male fertility probably really infuriates me a lot is this kind of sense that it's all about having a baby. And the reason why I mention that is that we know that men with infertility problems have a much higher risk of cancers and cardiovascular disease related sometimes to hormone levels. So when I refer also to not only about trying to improve sperm counts, but also it's about health, long-term health, counseling patients, informing them about potential problems. There are many causes of infertility in men, and therefore long-term they could have effects. So to give you a simple example, men who have undescended testis may have low sperm counts, but long-term they are an increased risk of testis cancer. In fact, four to tenfold according to studies. So Often, infertility is not just about children. I know that we all want to have them, but ultimately, we've also got to be a little bit wary. In the context that we're talking about in terms of fertility, diet and lifestyle, yeah, there are um, evidence about smoking, alcohol. Again, we've got to be a little bit careful about the kind of levels of evidence um, that there is. Of course, you mentioned uh, endocrine disruptors or endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, which is the association or exposure of certain chemicals um, that have estrogen effects potentially, which then have long-term kind of transgenerational effects in men. Uh, this is due to a utero exposure as well. Um, so therefore, I think for your own health as well, metabolically, to improve or reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, it's important to have diet and lifestyle modification. In terms of sperm and what happens to sperm long term, there is some evidence, of course, that some of these manipulations do help. But the problem is the levels of evidence and the amount of research that goes into this is limited. Antioxidants, again, if you look at studies, I mean, I've done studies uh, as part of a guidelines group. Others have, particularly a Cochrane analysis, did show improvement in um, quality of sperm. So you do sometimes see that particularly with DNA fragmentation as well. But we also have to remember that taking too many antioxidants can have a negative effect paradoxically because we need these ROS chemicals for normal sperm function. So we've got to little bit, be a little bit careful about all of this. So overall, I have seen patients to answer the question who have had improvement in sperm count. With kind of hormone stimulation, 
I yeah, the problem is I have seen some patients get sperm and ejaculate, but the problem is is that well they've got that anyway, because there's a condition called cryptosperma where sperm appears and disappears. So therefore are we just simply measuring it when it's at, at its peak when we're after stimulation? So there's lots of unknowns in all about this. But certainly there is nothing wrong and there's nothing harmful in modifying your diet, Mediterranean diet, exercising, taking out caffeine. Um the other issue would be in terms of antioxidants and just living a healthier life for many reasons because men might be at more risk, as we know, from cardiovascular disease anyway. So it's important to catch them early in their 20s and 30s before they're 60, 70, and all of this comes into play. All right. Again, excellent question, of course. Thank you so much indeed for your answer to this one as well. And we will go to actually all the... the kind of previous question as well. So you talked about COVID, thoughts on vaccine prior to IVF in relation to sperm? I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. Uh, and I think that, you know, in terms of COVID, we know it seems to affect the testis, as I said, those studies, but given the vaccination prior, I mean, it, this is in the context of prevention, um, you know, or transmission. The, tran the evidence for transgenerational transmission, in other words, to an embryo fetus, is very extremely limited and isn't really there. So I think we need more work, and I think it's too early to really say this. But I can tell you there are lots of studies going on about this at the moment. What's interesting about not COVID, but vaccination for, for example, human papillomavirus, what's quite interesting is that. So that's the wart virus, and certainly... Um, there's thoughts about whether you know, vaccination actually <clears throat> reduces HPV expression, which might actually have an effect on outcome in uh, IVF. I think COVID is too early. And I think essentially there is evidence, of course, that COVID can affect the testis. But again, the evidence is, is, is quite controversial. Um, and need to be more robust. But I certainly think when I see patients now, it's quite interesting. It's like, you know, obviously what's happened in the pandemic, when I see patients now, I always ask them, have you had COVID? If I see a semen analysis, you know, and it's interesting, you know, I've been in clinic today and I've, I've seen patients who've got normal semen analysis, sorry, previously because they've had kids and then suddenly come up with very severe abnormalities. And I essentially have, you know, asked them, you know, have you had COVID? Because I have seen that and I've seen patients who've certainly had <clears throat> this whose semen parameters have been badly affected. Now, the question was, how long do you wait? Do you wait for six months before you then repeat a semen analysis? So I've had patients who had no sperm, who definitely had COVID, potentially had problems in their testis, and then repeated the semen analysis about six months. Um, and that's what I'm waiting for at the moment, because it's too early to say that. So I think it's a very, very interesting you know, an intellectually thought-provoking question, which at the moment we can't fully answer uh, due to data. Oh, of course, Understa understandable. Um, and actually, one more on that, okay, similar. So let me just show you this. For females who have had COVID, have been any studies to show fertility have been impacted? I don't know that. Uh, I mean, there were the, the original first studies were obviously done in China, but I don't, I don't think there's any evidence as far as I know about that um, in, in terms of um, fertility potential. Uh, but of course, it's not my speciality, but I, uh, not that I know of. All right, of course, that's understandable. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let's have a look at the previous question. So, wouldn't you want to freeze anyway to prevent repeated repeat of surgical retrieval? Yeah, I mean, I, I was only talking in the context of freezing sperm because as an isolated procedure, because if you think about a patient who doesn't have any sperm and ejaculate and doesn't know if you're going to get sperm from a testicle. There are two things you could either do. One is you either say to them, okay, we're going to do an operation on your partner. We're going to try and extract sperm. If we find it, great, we're going to freeze it. And if we don't find it, then of course you have an answer as to potentially the way forwards for yourselves. And although disappointed as that may seem, the alternative is saying to them, look, you could do a synchronous cycle of ICSI and we extract the eggs from the female partner and the male partner has a has surgery on the same day. The question, the problem there is we know that in 50% of non-obstructive aged sperm, it's different, of course, with obstruction, but in 50% of non-obstruction, we won't find sperm. So what, what do the 50% who've gone through a cycle of stimulation do? Do they then freeze the eggs? Do they then have a donor backup? So the context which I was talking about freezing sperm is, yes, we would, once we found sperm, on a fresh cycle, want to freeze sperm, 
And on a frozen cycle, we would freeze sperm anyway. So we would freeze what we've got because it's almost like gold dust because actually we've got to use that. Amazing. Thank you so much. Once again, of course. And let's have a look, okay, at the question from Sayuri. Uh, we have morphology issues. 1% good quality, I think. Will this be the same on every cycle? Well, that depends, okay? So, again, we talked about lifestyle modification, looking at various causes. Now, the problem is abnormal forms. It's a really controversial, difficult area. We talked about this last week, in fact, with a huge amount of variance in reporting. I've seen labs... Uh, who, you know, you go to one lab and they report 0% normal forms, they go to another lab and they report, um, you know, uh, normal normal forms, which is about 4%. And it really is, you know, particularly, um, you know, upsetting because you're kind of left in a situation where you've got normal other parameters. And the problem is, is, you know, what do you do with these isolated abnormal forms? Is, is it significant? Of course, there are drugs that can cause abnormal forms. Of course, there are congenital problems, one in particular called globosis spermia. But on, as an isolation, you would normally expect all the other parameters to be abnormal if it was significant. So to kind of try and bypass this kind of difficult area, because if you think about it, if a sperm look, may look normal to one person, abnormal to another one, strictly speaking, it shouldn't be like that because it's done on strict criteria called a Kruger criteria. But it does happen. So one of the issues is that, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you kind of report this? So to try and bypass that, take out the abnormal forms out of the equation as the, a sort of a, a, a factor that is confounding, then what you can do is you look at total motile count, which is the volume multiplied by concentration multiplied by uh, percentage motility to get the total motile count, which we think is probably a better indicator of fertility potential in patients. But it's a very good question, and that's the problem. Now, you know, in theory, you know, as I said to you, the, prob the probability is that you don't know whether somebody with 1% normal forms is going to be fertile or non-fertile. What the key about all of this is the that patients have been trying. I've seen patients who get pregnant who do seed analysis before they get married at three months before they've been trying. But you've got to remember the definition of infertility. And that definition of infertility is the inability to conceive after one year of unprotected intercourse. And 75% of couples conceive by year, 95% by two years. So to, if you kind of do a seed analysis, you've kind of got to open up a can of worms because if you do it pre-marriage or you do it in three months in and you find in fact you've only got 1% normal forms, that can have a huge psychological toll on both of you. And does that necessarily mean to say that you're infertile? No. And so I think you've got to be a little bit careful about over-interpretation of what we term as isolated teratogespermia, which is what just having isolation abnormal forms is. Sorry, I hope that answers the question. All right. Again, thank you so much indeed. Um, okay, let's have a look. Next question is up. So... What causes slow or lack of liquefaction, uh, and is this a concern? Yeah, so liquefaction is thought to be allowing the sperm to kind of confer the motility or movement uh, and occurs. Liquefaction is normal. Um, again, it's not something that I particularly have seen, if I'm honest, in many years of doing this. And I think that one of the issues is that it's liquefaction sperm occurs due to an enzyme called PSA, which is produced by a prostate, prostatic specific antigen, which is actually a marker for prostate cancer. And it's a, it's a protease or an enzyme which, which liquefies the ejaculate. And that, that's the process by which it occurs. If you stand in an ejaculate, normally it will liquefy um, and, and you see it become runny effectively. Uh, again, the association and its effects in terms of fertility are uh, are largely unknown in many ways, and a lot of work, more work needs to be done in that area. Is it a concern? I, I personally would not see it as a major concern um, because, effectively, we don't know, um, you know, effectively what the role of liquefaction is fully in terms of sperm function, but we think it is involved in um, the sperm's ability in terms of motility, um, uh, in terms of the, the female partner uh, when it's in the, uh, the female genital tract. All right. Again, thank you so much indeed. Okay, let's have a look. Next question is a different one this time. Can you please tell me more about gon gonadotropin? Are they really working? So I think you're referring to, please correct me if I'm wrong, to um, hormone stimulation. 
in the context of uh, having azoospermia or no sperm or hormone therapy. So just to very briefly tell you how that works, you effectively, what you could do is you can effectively, in some men, people argue, given gonadotrophins, which is FSH and LH stimulation to raise testosterone, potentially stimulate sperm production in that way. The other way of doing it is with anti-estrogens to stimulate FSH, LH, gonadotrophins to stimulate um, testosterone and sperm production. Again, the evidence for these is quite limited. And the problem is when people do trials, they don't really use controls. They use their own, the patients themselves. As I said, some patients produce sperm, appear and disappear. So do they really work? We don't know that. And we're doing a study at the moment, interesting analysis of the data and literature, which I can't, because of confidentiality reasons, tell you the result of that at the moment. But suffice to say that the data is really quite mixed and very difficult to interpret. So what we've done is a meta-analysis. So hopefully in about a month's time, we'll be able to share that data. Does it work? Well, I think the only time I would be giving it anyway to stimulate testosterone is in men who um, have uh, low testosterone, because then you've got kind of nothing to lose. But you've got to remember, these kind of drugs are expensive and not without side effects. And in fact, in men, they're off-label. You've got to remember, they're not licensed to be used in men. They're licensed in women. So that's where the difficulty and controversy about all of this happens or comes from. All right, again, thank you so much indeed. Okay, uh, definitely interesting. And let's have a look. Karen has added some clinics uh, use ICSIS standard. When there is no known reason for infertility, is there any benefit to do this or can the risk of the process be greater than any benefits? It's a very good question. So if you look at results from ICSI, they seem to be superior to IVF treatments. And that's the kind of argument that, that you obviously know about, that people use. The, the evidence for IVF treatments causing congenital problems is limited. I'm not an IVF doctor as such, but ICSI can be associated with other congenital problems. However, it's weighing up results and what's best. And that's where the sperm count comes in. That's what the sperm is there. So, you know, what, what is the quality of the sperm? So really, ideally, ICSI should be being used for male factor infertility. And more and more, we tend to use these type of treatments as well as IMSI and other treatments for, um, for DNA fragmentation as well. So it depends on the IVF unit. I suppose in many ways, there doesn't seem to be any standardization of this. Um, and that's one of the problems. And I think that's what needs to be addressed by the HFEA. So perhaps, perhaps we are overusing ICSI in that setting. All right. Thank you. That's definitely interesting to hear as well. Thank you so much indeed. Um, okay. And let's have a look. Okay. A few questions left. We will be slowly finishing. Uh, so if you have anything left, uh, go ahead and type those in. And the question is, so for surgical retrieved sperm, what is the conventional method to freeze neat with tissue debris or processed in some way? Both, actually. So, yeah, so they can extract the sperm um, and do it that way. Or alternatively, sometimes when they've got tissue still, they can freeze the tissue. Um, so, I mean, not an embryologist, but that would be more an embryological kind of question. Um, but they can do it both ways. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And uh, next question we have, what would you suggest if there is 60% of dead sperm, what could cause this? And is it still possible to conceive naturally? You're talking about vitality of sperm. And again, you know, vitality, what is, I mean, you will get in a sample dead sperm, that's the natural cycle. So what, is, what causes non-vital sperm? In other words, sperm that's not alive. Well, in that context, you need to look at infections. Okay, certainly I've seen that, urinary tract infections, STIs. Um, sometimes you've also got to remember that dead sperm, so I've, uh, the context I would normally see is either infection, but normally if you have a congenital problem, okay, so you can sometimes get various disorders that can get immotile sperm. I mean, some of these conditions are things called cartaginase or immotile cilia syndrome, uh, which is associated with chest problems as well, where the flagella or tails aren't moving 
Um, and the sperm, in a sense, are alive, but it depends on how you define vitality. If it's actually if you've done a vital stain on the cells. Um, so the most common one we see is in terms of infection. But again, the thresholds that we use, you know, are you know controversial. You know, I mean, various drug treatments potentially can add toxins, or toxins to the testis can also cause this. But you would have you normally see very severe cases. Uh, of, of this. Now, if you see non-vital sperm, one thing I would be looking at would be how many white cells are in the ejaculate. So, in other words, are there any white cells in the ejaculate which might indicate infection as well? And I probably want to culture the sperm as well and also do some other infection tests to make sure there isn't an ongoing infection causing that. All right. Again, thank you for yet another interesting question. Uh, okay, and then an answer. Um, and now it might be our final question for tonight. So let's have a look. Okay, so can DNA fragmentation testing be carried out on sperm collected by microtesa? If yes, does it matter if the sperm is fresh or has been frozen? Right. Very <laughs> good question. Very technical. It can. It is only a research setting that it's done currently, but it can be done. Uh, and the issue about microtesi is that, you know, the question you've got to ask yourself is why are you doing microtesi in the first place uh, in this setting? So one of the things, there are two reasons why you do microtesi. One is non-obstructive agent sperm, to obtain sperm, and then you freeze it. And then you use that sperm for ICSI treatment. The other setting where you do testicular sperm extraction, we'll call it, for men who are non-azeospermic, who have sperm in ejaculate, is as a kind of a, um, a final kind of treatment in patients who have raised DNA fragmentation or damage, where you basically um, essentially want to try and bypass the DNA fragmentation, the argument being that testicular sperm in some studies has been shown to have less fragmented DNA than ejaculated sperm. So you can then do that. And that's been shown in some studies, so you can measure DNA fragmentation within testicular sperm and compare it with ejaculated. The other context we sometimes can argue to use it would be in patients who might have sperm frozen and they've had multiple cycles because there is an argument that uh, freezing sperm can damage the DNA as well. Um, and you might, they might want to do it to see whether if they're failing embryogenesis or failing IVF cycles using frozen sperm, is it a... Is it due to the DNA damage of the sperm? In effect, though, the problem is, is that in patients who have these kind of problems, it's like gold dust because, again, you've done an operation to extract that sperm. So, therefore, it's, 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 it's a test that you've got to be very careful about doing. So, to answer the question directly now is to say, you know, you normally you can measure DNA damage in sperm, testicular sperm. You would normally do a testicular sperm extraction in the context of raised DNA damage fresh on the day of an ICSI cycle as a method to try and bypass or try and circumnavigate, mitigate the problem of sperm, ejaculated sperm and its effect in terms of DNA damage, because the argument being that testicular sperm has less fragmented DNA. Again, I hasten to add, you've got to be really cautious about this, yeah, because the evidence and levels of evidence for this are extremely limited. Um, and again, we've written guidance on this and said that you're going to be doing this. It should ideally be done in a research setting. I hope that answers that extremely, really very good question, actually. Very good question. But thank you. Thank you so much indeed. OK, um, very happy to hear so many uh, different questions, but also very uh, detailed and great, great questions you are providing here with uh, to, uh, sorry, you are providing tonight. Thank you so much. And uh, well, it looks like that was our final question. So, um, well, I just want you to see, first of all, has, there are many, many thank yous coming up your way for answering all those questions. As you can see, thank you very much for giving such clarity when answering questions. Very helpful very useful uh thank you so much more helpful most helpful of course thank you so much anything else it's a pleasure. You'd like to add? I, I think it, the questions are amazing uh absolutely amazing i've got just <laughs> i've got more interesting questions than perhaps people that sometimes i train so i uh, it's fascinating and I, it just shows you how people you know should be underestimated in life because ultimately you know uh, patients should be treated with the kind of dignity and respect that they they know enough and i'm very impressed actually i mean you know, and i hope it's been useful but thank you
Definitely useful. Thank you so much indeed. I think those uh, comments speak for themselves really. So definitely helpful. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. It's been a brilliant session indeed. And I'm glad that we are discussing all those topics and you are still coming in here and asking the questions, great questions as well. Uh, Professor Minhas, you've been brilliant as well. Thank you so much. And I do hope that we My will pleasure. simply uh, have another webinar with you. That's for sure. And I'm already great. looking forward to it. <laughs> so. Thank Thanks you. So much. I just want to mention Take care. you know we will have uh, this has been recorded. You will have a chance to watch this tomorrow. It will be available on our YouTube channel. And if you are looking for some other topics, you can visit my Ivy Offenses. There are plenty of Ivy of webinars there. And well, I just hope to see you tomorrow. Another topic is up. So here at 8 p.m. UK time and uh, ask your questions again. Thank you so much, Professor Minhas, once again. Everyone, have a lovely evening. And bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.